There are so many voices in this country that are speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with, with Rochester. Rochester Indian Media. There's knowledge you can easily get watching television or um, the books he's written, and I don't have the time to go through his accomplishments, nor do you. Uh, degrees and accomplishments, awards, unbelievable. But, but without any further ado, I feel Cornell West is a brother whose knowledge is here, and his Karen is above that. It's my honor and my privilege to present, to present Dr. Cornell West. What a blessing to be in Syracuse. The south side of Syracuse. Yeah. Oh, how blessed I am, my poor brother John. You can tell the words flowing straight from his soul, straight from his heart. And the love was coming right back at you, brother John. I'm telling you. Indeed, I want to thank Sister Carol for her magnificent work at Syracuse Peace Council. Sister Rachel, representing this grand institution, Tucker Missionary Baptist Church, founded by Reverend Forrest Adams in 1954. Yeah. Straight out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And now led by the Reverend Dr. Leslie L. Johnson II. Yeah. And I was blessed to worship here this morning and it enriched my soul. Yeah. With the spirit, the people, the vision, the rejoicing, and most importantly, the love, the yes. deep love, oh yes. What can I say about Brother Padilla Latif? Oh my God, what an artist, what a love warrior. He's my Muslim brother, he's my Muslim brother. And brother John, I appreciate your words. That's very important because I've always tried to be just one small part of the caravan of love that the Isley Brothers sang about with such power. <laughs> and the love supreme that John Coltrane reflected. I was just in his house in the room where he wrote Love Supreme, December 9, 1964, and I could feel myself levitate. <laughs> and I was levitating because, of course, Coltrane like the Isley Brothers, like Nina Simone, like Donny Hathaway, like Stevie Wonder. These are not just entertainers. That's right. That they own a love train that Curtis Mayfield sang about. Well, all right. And that's why we're here today. Because we've got some brothers and sisters of all colors, all cultures, all civilizations, all sexual orientations who say, we want to be on the love train. Oh yes, we want to be on the love train. And we want the world to know that there are some brothers and sisters of all colors in the midst of the American empire 
who love the precious babies in Pakistan and in Yemen and in Somalia just like they love vanilla brothers and sisters and black and brown and indigenous babies too. We believe in moral consistency. What Jane Austen called constancy in her fascinating bourgeois formulation of it within the British imperial context. We love you, Jane. We love you. Constancy. Keeping track of every person. And when they're rendered invisible, when they're pushed to the margins, when they're pushed to the peripheral, we try to cast a spotlight on them. You could be atheist and agnostic, you could be Buddhist, you could be Hindu like Gandhi, you could be a Jesus-loving free black man like myself. No one of us in the front of the train, we all on it together. Oh yes, we all on it together. All on it together. I want to salute all of you all, both here in Syracuse and in various parts of the other part of New, of New York, upstate New York, something is happening in Syracuse and something is happening in this part of the country that you all actually have more and more be cast a spotlight on the underside of the American empire. And because there's so much sleepwalking in the country, people wake up at different times, you know. Henry David Thoreau realized that in Walden Pond, that epigraph, what can I do to awake my fellow citizens from their sleepwalking? Well, Brother Henry, it takes a while sometimes. <laughs> That's all right. We continue to try to speak the truth, try to expose lies, try to bear witness, not in the spirit of self-righteousness. Because all of us have had moments when we were sleepwalking too. You don't come out of the womb with revolutionary fire. <laughs> like Malcolm X. <laughs> after Elijah loved him. And then after he began to outlove Elijah. And how that love to spill over from the chocolate side to the vanilla side to other sides of town. Oh yes. Dorothy Day, love warrior to the to the core. Never forget your sister Dorothy. You know, I know I'm in Syracuse. The Barricans, oh my God, Brother Daniel, Brother Phil, and the others. <laughs> Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, we shall never forget your witness, your truth telling, you pointing out the lies and the crimes of your own government, even as you never forgot precious treatment of your own precious Jewish brothers and sisters by a Jew-hating thug named Hitler and Nazis. Edward Zaid, such a little brother. He was my dear brother. Oh, yes, my dear Palestinian brother, telling the truth, exposing lies, trying to ensure that cast a spotlight on those whose humanity rendered invisible. I want to begin with an epigraph, though, from the great W.B. Du Bois. I want you to picture in your mind, he's 89 years old. He's just emerged out of a courtroom. They had him in handcuffs. He's part of the Peace Information Center trying to rid the world of nuclear bombs. We've got 17,300 now still in place. He's cast as a enemy of the U.S., the same Du Bois founder of the NAACP, first PhD at Harvard, write the dissertation on the suppression the African slave trade, the same Du Bois that went on to write Souls of Black Folk in 1903, the same Du Bois that left the country three years before he died after he joined the Communist Party and said, cheer up, black folk. You'll never win in America. You better cast it on a global and international stage if you want to preserve your sanity. That's the Du Bois I'm talking about. He decided to embark on a trilogy, three novels at 89 years old. That's what kind of revolutionary fire he had. Then that first novel called The Ordeal of Manzar, turned to page 275. And he says, I've been wrestling with four questions all of my life. And I've yet to provide 
adequate responses, not just propositional answers, but responses in terms of a life lived. An embodiment and an enactment of vision. The first question, how does integrity face oppression? How does integrity face oppression? The second was, what does honesty do in the face of deception? What does honesty do in the face of deception? The third question, what does decency do in the face of insult? What does decency do in the face of insult? And that last query, the boy says, how does virtue meet brute force? And those are the four pillars, it seems to me, that bring us together. Because if all of us are concerned with what does it mean to be human, what kind of human beings will we choose to be in our brief move from our mama's womb to tomb? No accident our English word human comes from the Latin humanda, which means burying and bury all. Because yes, it's true, we all featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces, whose body will one day be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. That's who we are, we're not here that long. And the question is, what kind of person will you be? Well, it has something to do with integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue, so that when they talk about you at your funeral, they'll have something to say beyond just how many material possessions you had, how many commodities you accumulated, and how many folk you dominated. Oh, yes, that's what Tucker Missionary Baptist Church is all about. That's the tradition that produced this crack vessel, I come out of Shiloh Baptist, they call it Tucker Missionary. Yes. Same end and same aim. I want to be a certain kind of human being in which in the face of brute force, in the face of care, in the face of trauma, in the face of stigma, somehow I was able to raise to a higher moral and spiritual ground that allowed me to connect myself with those who came before and tried to teach me, lo and behold, you can be a better human being no matter what your circumstances and conditions are. Oh yeah, that's the tradition I'm talking about. That's the tradition I'm talking about. I'm talking about the tradition of Emma Teal's mother when she stepped to the lectern and her baby is in the coffin. Only child killed by cowardly American terrorists, cowardly American white supremacists in gut bucket Jim Crow Mississippi Emmett Teal. What you got to say Miss Teal to the world? Speak on behalf of not just black people, not just America. Speak on behalf of the best of the human spirit. We hear your pain. We see the tears in your eyes. They kept the casket open, didn't they? So that 50,000 people marched to Robert, Robert's Temple Church of God in Christ on the west side of Chicago in August of 1955. She said, we're going to keep that casket open. We want the world to see the night side of the American empire. Oh, yeah. But what did she say when she stepped in that lecture and they had cameras from all around the world and with tears in her eyes? and with Socratic energy flowing, keeping track of the dogma of white supremacy, she said, what? I don't have a minute to hate. I will pursue justice for the rest of my life. What goes into that kind of witness? What goes into that kind of vision? You don't do it by yourself. You gotta come out of a tradition. You gotta come out of a community. You have to have remembrance. You have to have reverence for something bigger than your ego. And you have to have resistance. You have to be willing to straighten your back up. Brother Martin used to say what? Anytime, every day, people straighten their backs up there, going somewhere, because folk can't ride your back unless it's big. when it ain't funny, scratching when it don't itch, just scared and intimidated and afraid. Brother, preach today on what? Don't 
be afraid. Marcus Garvey I used to have a black man leading every rally. The Negro is not afraid. Because once in fact you conquer fear, then you're really willing to tell the truth and bear witness and be willing to pay a cost. And there is an intimate relation between the preciousness of Emmett Till and the preciousness of the children in Afghanistan, in Yemen, and Somalia. The underside of the American Empire. Of course, we don't stop there. We've got a lot of poor, white, precious brothers and sisters catching hell. Why? Because instead of integrity, they're dealing with the effects of institutionalized cupidity, the love of money. We live in a society ruled by big banks and big corporations, disproportionately shaping how we understand ourselves and what possibility poor and working people have and what access they have to resources that 1% that the Occupy movement rightly zeroed in on, and we could have zeroed in on the 0.11%. The 1% of the population that got 95% of the income growth in the last four years. The 1% of the population that now have 43% of the wealth in the United States when 40% of children of color live in utter poverty and 22% of all children in this nation live in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world that's morally obscene, spiritually profane. But where's the holy anger? Where's the righteous indignation? How somehow do we shatter the callousness and the indifference but also the fear because in a society that rules, is ruled by money, the Wu-Tang Clan, Kareem, Cash rules, everything around me. But it doesn't have to rule me. It's around me. It doesn't have to rule me. It's part of the genius of me. In such a society, there's an intimate relation between cupidity and venality. And venality is just a fancy word of saying we live in the age of the sellout. <laughs> just give enough money, access to power, position, possible publicity, status, stature, and all of a sudden, the vision that you had becomes truncated. All of a sudden, you become so well-adjusted to injustice that you still think somehow that you tie the integrity. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up. And this is especially so for poor people and working people, and especially so for people of color. The last thing Emma Till's mother had in mind was to tell the truth, to bear witness, to serve and sacrifice, and then generate just a whole battalion of highly successful people of color in high places who have sold their souls for a mess of pottage. Success. No, 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 no. Emma Till's mother sacrificed. My grandmother and grandfather sacrificed to produce folk who are great, and he or she is greatest among you will be your servant. The quality of your service to the least of these, the widow and the orphan, the stranger, the fatherless, the motherless, the poor working peoples. Okay, brothers and lesbians and sisters, the elderly, that's the spiritual and moral focus of greatness as opposed to just being highly successful. We live in a land obsessed with dollars and smartness. The dollars become so ubiquitous that it generates a form of idolatry that produces spiritual malnutrition and moral constipation. <laughs> the emptiness of the soul, a cold-heartedness in me, spiritedness and those who still remember what's right is just stuck in the dirty flow. You're morally constipated. 
too much avarice, too much greed there, too much insecurity, too much fear. And we wonder why it is that so many of our young folk find it so difficult to understand the genius of the Sarah Vaughns and the genius of those spiritual giants who had callings, not just careers who had genuine vocations tied to invocations, not just professions, who, the anthem of black people, lifted every voice, but refused to be an echo. In America, we specialize in producing copies rather than originals. And the reason why is because the intimate connection connecting of the dots between the Wall Street complex with the financialization of our capitalist society where 42% of the profits go to big banks. They don't produce products, they produce deals. Billions of dollars remain in private hands. $2.2 trillion offshore don't have to whatsoever. And when they engage in intense forms of criminality, insider trading, market manipulation, fraudulent activities, how many Wall Street executives have gone to jail since 2008 because of the catastrophe? Zero, zilch, nothing whatsoever. But let Jamal get caught with a crack bag right on the corner and he's straight to jail. Let the teacher get caught. Send us straight to jail. I've been teaching in jail for 37 years. I was just Friday night with my class in Rollway. 150 brilliant brothers. 62% of them in there for soft drugs. Seven years, 15 years, 25 years. But you got these criminals running around sipping tea in Washington coming out of Wall Street. The old brother West, you sound like you're anti-rich. No, I'm not anti-rich. I'm anti-injustice. Oh, you sound like you anti-American. I'm not anti-American. I'm anti-injustice. Oh, yeah. But I tell you what, I'm a cross bearer before I'm a flag waver. Don't wave your flag in front of me if you're going to subjugate people and kill innocent children and treat workers like they're marginal utilities and d demean women and somehow lose sight of the humanity of gay brothers and lesbian sisters, if that flag doesn't conform to my understanding of the cross, and for me the cross is about unarmed truth, and the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. And if you're not allowing suffering to speak, you're not telling the truth. And I believe in unconditional love, and I know a lot of my left comrades don't always agree with me on that, that's all right. You got a right to be wrong. <laughs> working together, but I believe in unconditional love. And see, for me, the kingdom of God ain't no brand. And the cause of freedom ain't no commercial. And the struggle for, for black dignity is not an advertisement. It's a way of life. And they are connected. Vicious legacies of white supremacy, male supremacy, anti-Jewish hatred, anti-Arab hatred, anti-Muslim hatred, homophobia, tied to a capitalist system that is a failed system when it comes to poor people and working people. A failed system. We have yet to meet that criteria of responding to the needs of the poor and working slices of our fragile experiment in democracy. But it's also tied to imperial crimes. It's also tied to the refusal of the United States to understand the degree to which we're not only a fragile experiment in democracy, but we are an imperial endeavor. It always upsets me when I see these journalists and scholars talking about the enslavement of black people being America's original sin. That's not true. White supremacy was the original sin, but the original sin was the vicious treatment of our indigenous brothers and sisters. That was the first one. Let's get it right. Don't get it twisted. Though. 
our indigenous brothers and sisters don't have to be in the room for us to be hypersensitive about their suffering. What they underwent the dispossession of their land, the violation of their children and men and women. And it's not a matter of PC chit chat, it's a matter of trying to tell the truth about how America became America. And then comes that crime against humanity with the enslavement of black people in Africa. That's number two. That's number two. But the challenge becomes what? The challenge becomes how do we tell this truth in such a way that we can still remain agents, that we don't feel debilitated, we don't feel paralyzed. When you look up at what you're up against, you say, oh my God. <laughs> they got the armies, and they got the navies, and they got nuclear bombs, and they got FBI, CIA. We probably got some FBI here. Glad to have you here. Glad to have you here. Yeah, we telling the truth. That's right, we gonna tell the truth. Oh yeah, welcome, welcome. Whosoever will, come on in. Listen. But at the same time, when you think of the history of those who engaged in their fallible quest for integrity in the face of cupidity and finality, who fundamentally wanted to be honest in the face of deception, could look at the corporate media with its massive weapons of distraction, <laughs> refusing to attend to crucial things but attending to the bottom line, money, 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 profits, profit, profits. So you got Fox News, mean-spirited, cold-hearted Republican propaganda. Then you got MSEBC, milquetoast, spineless, neoliberal Democratic Party propaganda. None of them want to talk about drones. None of them want to talk about innocent civilians. None of them want to talk about the precious children that have been killed in our name. None of them want to talk about poverty. None of them want to talk about Wall Street. No, it's just this little deodorized, sterilized, sanitized, truncated discourse that goes as political dialogue in a market-driven society. No, we refuse that kind of parochialism. We refuse that kind of provincialism. Thank God for Sister Amy Goodman and the others. Oh yeah, thank God for that. Broaden the discourse to Tom Hartman. Broaden the discourse. All we want is the truth. Tell us what's going on when you're privatizing our public educational system, trying to demonize the teachers. We know that rich kids get taught and poor kids get tested. We don't like it. We don't like it. Why? Because poor kids are just as precious as rich kids. We got against anybody's kids, but we were not born. We may have been born that night, but not last night. The consensus that high then conceals the catastrophes taking place every day. Look at the treatment of the trade union movement as if somehow it's some powerful special interest that's not concerned with public interest, but the business roundtable somehow was viewed as having the same status as the trade union movement. When did that become normal? I know you all in Syracuse with rich history you have. There used to be a labor page in the newspaper. Now it's just a business page. That's the tilt toward capital. People are talking about this book now, Brother Thomas's book, the Kenny's book. Capital in the 21st century. Lo and behold, the rewards of capital are beyond that of economic growth, and therefore wages are stagnating and declining, and therefore wealth inequality is constituting a challenge to our democratic. And then the mainstream start break dancing like MC Hammer. <laughs> oh my God, we got new, new insight. Oh, really? People have been saying that for decades. Thank you, Tom. But we have to be able to make the connection between the Wall Street complexes, the corporate multiplex, the imperial crimes, of which drones, of course, is a major manifestation. And then, of course, 
there is the prison industrial complex. Slavery by another name. And see, when it comes to the prison industrial complex, it's intimately connected with the wars and the military budget. Why? Because even in the midst of budgetary constraints, we can always find money for wars and for prison. Wars and for prison. Oh, when it comes to quality education, can't find a penny. When it comes to jobs with a living wage, can't find a penny. When it comes to decent housing, oh, things are so tight. When it comes to health care, things are so tight. And even with Brother Obama, we appreciate the extension in terms of health care, but we know it's a bonanza for the pharmaceutical companies. It's a bonanza for the insurance companies. It just broadens their market and has a mandate for them to have to pay. Okay, we allow for the celebration of the extension, but we want justice. We just don't want extension of lack of relative injustice. Oh, but Brother West, it's better. Okay, okay, it is better. But Brother Malcolm used to say, what, you got the back nine inches, you're pulling out six inches and want me to celebrate your progress? <laughs> pull it out, pull it out. <laughs> but the prison industrial complex is real. There's been a Marshall Plan in the last 30 years in this country. But the Marshall Plan has not gone into infrastructure, education, housing, and health care. It has gone into prisons. $500 billion. When I first started teaching in the prison, prisons in Norfolk, about 1974, there was about 300,000 folk in prison. Today there's 2.4 million. 2.4 million. Disproportionately poor and very much a chocolate affair. It's more like the National Basketball. Ball Association and the National Hockey League. <laughs> and yet we know 12% of young black brothers and sisters flying high in the friendly sky every week, 12%. Vanilla side of town, 12%. 65% of convictions black. That means you got a criminal justice system which in some ways is itself criminal. <laughs> is itself criminal. Generation after generation after generation sending these precious brothers, black and brown and poor white, to a prison industrial complex, and yet they're intaking at the same rate as white. And I don't want the jails just to be more colorful. I don't want more white brothers and sisters just to go to jail so we have parity. I'm just talking about hypocrisy and mendacity and the gap between what people are saying and what is being done. And that's part and parcel of a history. That's part and parcel of a history. But everybody knows when it comes down to it, that lo and behold, if black folk straighten their backs up and become awake, takes on new life. The trade union movement takes on new life. The feminist movement with the womanist injection takes on new life. The anti-homophobic movement takes on new life. We don't have to worry about people saying, oh, Lord, Brother West, you're spending time around those peace, peace activists. How come you don't spend time around black folk? I said, they got black folk in the peace movement. What you talking about? <laughs> but the perception is it's primarily vanilla. And of course, it is a reflection of the fact that we haven't picked up on the legacy of Rabbi Abraham Jeshua, Joshua Heschel, Martin Luther King Jr., Dorothy Day, the Barrigans, they connected the dots. They connected the dots. And once you connect the dots, you constitute a threat to the powers that be. I don't care what color those in office are. Oh, yeah. And the lion said, here, look at Brother Martin Luther King Jr. We know that when he died, 72% of Americans disapproved of him, 55% of black people disapproved of Brother Martin. How come? He's trying to bring all poor people together, all colors. Critique the capitalist system. He had memories of being in that paddy wagon on the way to Reedsville Prison. They put him in the dark with a German shepherd, threatening him for five hours, didn't tell him where they'd taken him. And when they finally reached 
the prison in that tall county in Georgia. The only folk there was Andy Young and his father. Brother Andy Young told me, he said, Brother, when we saw Martin, we were convinced he had a nervous breakdown. He could not walk straight at all. He had tears in his eyes. And the only thing he could say was, this is the cross we must bear for the freedom of our people. That's the kind of brother we talk about. He's not a god. He's not a deity. He's a broke. He's a cracked vessel like anybody else. He just had enough courage and he had enough vision and he had enough memory. He had enough integrity, honesty, and decency to try to connect the dots. That's where we are today. We got to learn how to connect these dots. We got to connect it with the new immigrant movement. We got to connect it with the folk who just arrived since 1965. Not just from Mexico, but from Asia and from Africa and from the Caribbean. How do we connect the dots? We're in the embryonic stages of connecting these dots. But lo and behold, here in Syracuse, you all starting to connect these dots. And the rest of the country is keeping track. And with the drones. It's a pillar that connects the precious humanity of not just the children, but the innocent ones in Somalia and Yemen and Pakistan and Afghanistan. And more and more in Africa, of course, AFRICOM now, of course, with the major expansion of U.S. military on the African continent as the struggle for resources intensifies with China. It's connecting the dots is not going to be just a matter now of colorful faces in high places. I did celebrate with Brother Barack Obama one only because the two he was running against were dangerous. <laughs> but it turns out he was dangerous too. <laughs> two. Bush, 45 drones. Late years, Obama, 400 drones. How could anybody who wants to be morally consistent talk about the war crimes of George Bush and not also talk about the war crimes of Barack Obama? You have to be consistent. Oh, Brother West, he's a black man. He's a brother. He's a brother. He's a brother. I understand he's a brother. I'll fight against white supremacy, too. Let some white supremacists attack him. I start swinging like Muhammad Ali in Elephant Jarrow. The right wing is dangerous. They're mistreating my brother. They're disrespecting my brother. They're demonizing my brother. They think he's a Muslim. <laughs> they think he's a socialist. Please. <laughs> right wing. But that is not an excuse for us not to tell the truth, expose lies, and bear witnesses when, in fact, his policies are tilted toward Wall Street, they're tilted toward authoritarian sensibilities with a national security state and national surveillance keeping track of every citizen already assassinated for American citizens with no accountability whatsoever. We just want to tell the truth. We just want to bear witness to justice. It's something bigger than your color. It's bigger than your gender. It's bigger than your class. It's bigger than your nation. It's about what kind of human being you want to be. Connect the God, Syracuse. That's why we here. And we're on our way to the base. We're on our way to the base.
happening in the world, of course. You have small classes, you have teachers who have intimate relations, you have massive resources. The parents often are very involved. And the children are told every day, that, or at least once a week, how brilliant they are, whether it's true or not. <laughs> so that, that has a positive effect on them. Whereas poor working kids get tested. We've got this obsession with testing that's tied to profiteering and privatizing the public school system where the tests themselves not only measure the kids but the teachers. And then, most tragically for me, and this is something myself and Wynton Marcellus and others have been wrestling with for 20 years, because we generated different, various forms of learning through the arts. The arts programs tend to be the first ones cut. And so you get the precious poor children going into schools with, not, with no, very little access to arts, imagination, critical intelligence tied to exploration of what it is to be human as opposed to simply numbers. And so, uh, uh, so that I hear what you're saying. I mean, the education for freedom, education but for liberation, fundamental. And I think Di Diane Ravage's recent work is very important in this regard. But we do need to study what's going on in Finland and other places where they do have quality education. Of course, so much of it does come down to poverty. I mean, Finland, they have 2% two, two of their children live in poverty. We got 40 in the inner city. We got 22 in the country, you see what I mean? I do want to acknowledge, too, Brother Michael and Sister Ellen, who have been so wonderful for me. Oh, my God. Sister Ellen and Brother Michael, I thank you so much. Love you all. I think this brother right here had his hand. Yes, yes. You mentioned the loss of uh, Native American land uh, and America built on that loss. Uh, currently, in the United States, uh, is spending billions of dollars each year supporting Israel, which has taken over Palestinian territory, continues to, op uh, to occupy it, and oppress the Palestinian people. What are your thoughts? Well, one is, I think, well, again, we have to be morally consistent here. And it has to be always morally consistent within the sensitivity to context that occupation across the board is immoral and unjust. And more than unjust. If there were a Palestinian occupation of Jewish brothers and sisters, we ought to be raising our voices at the highest level to oppose occupation. There is now a very ugly, vicious Israeli occupation of Palestinian brothers and sisters. We ought to be raising our voices at the highest pitch against occupation. You see? No doubt about that. No doubt about that. I think at the same time, I mean, we, all, we recognize that uh, our, our precious Jewish brothers and sisters have a very, very distinctive history in, in the history, especially of the West, in terms of just how deep hatred of Jews really is. And therefore, we understand the focus and preoccupation with security. And so the question becomes, how then do we talk honestly? about the fundamental need for security so that Jews themselves do not undergo any kind of vicious attack or assault alongside the dignity and justice for Palestinians because the occupation is not going to be a means by which that Jewish security can be procured. And so we need to have a serious, robust public conversation about that. Very much so. And we proceed on the notion, again, very basic, that a Palestinian baby has the same value as a Jewish baby, the Jewish baby has the same value as a Palestinian baby, and they are precious, precious, old so precious. That's the beginning of a country. But, but, but the, the atmosphere has to be one where people feel as if they can enter in with people having a sense of what is at stake. Because dignity and justice for Palestinians are negotiable. Security for Jewish brothers and sisters anywhere, not just in Israel. Anywhere, it's unnegotiable. Why? Because that's what it is to be morally consistent. That's what it is to take a higher spiritual ground. My brother. Um, you connected the dots uh, on inequality. You see inequality here on a domestic plane and um, in an international situation. I was hoping you could connect the dots between war and the degradation of our environment. Yeah. That's another great question. Oh, that's a that's a wonderful question, my brother. Very, very much so. You are absolutely right. I didn't get a chance to say anything about the domination of nature, anything about the ecological catastrophe that's right around the corner, and it looks like we just act as if put our heads in the sand, as it were. I mean, I did try to make a connection between the terrorism 
because when I talked about black people dealing with terrorism, that's internal terrorism. When I talk about indigenous people, that's terrorism. That's just not inequality. See, that's just not inequality. Inequality is real. But terror is something else. That's tied to trauma. That's psychic as well as political and economic. You see. But you are absolutely right. I didn't say I mumbled a word about it. Ecological, impending ecological catastrophe, and I need to say much more, and that must always be a crucial part, an integral part of our concerns of connecting the dots. So thank you so very much for that. Hi, I'd love what you were saying. Um, but you know, my, you know I'm from Harlem. My name is Reverend Olivia Armstrong. And this is going to take a minute because it was inspired by Reverend Dr. James Washington. I am a poet, a poetess since 1988. And it's called Drones. Well, I know drones kill while they fly over the hills. I know that drones will knock out your cell phones and leave your family alone. Drones are a complicated beast it hides in the mystery. Who's up for a feast? Drones are U.S. dichotomy. They save lives and help the economy. Hm. Drones supposed to keep U.S. safe. Someone lied, left us in disgrace. Hm. Really? Or is it another symptom about the eugenics, science, and genocide of a race? Hm. Drones tried to keep people blind. We ask God to keep our mind. Today we must stop killing the symptoms. They keep coming back and keeping us on track. We have, we have to now take it by its roots and walk in our ancestors' boots. And there is no more time to keep being spooked in, you, in your brother's memory. Thank you. I just wrote it. James Melvin Washington. My, my best friend ever had in the world. My testament of hope. You all know James Melvin Washington. The book he put together, a collection of writings of Martin Luther King Jr. It's the one text known all around the world. And he passed in 19... I was just at his grave just, just, just a few weeks ago. He passed in 1997. Thank you so much. Who's next? Hi, um, I have a question. Um, how can we understand the popularization of drone technology? So in Coachella, they had drones uh, taking pictures and video. You've had, um, recently, there was an article about drone technology being used secretly over Compton in Los Angeles. And then you also have Amazon coming out with their drone technology to like deliver your packages. Yeah, so can you speak on that? Thank you. Yeah, I think one thing that has to do that we live in an age of hypercapitalism where the attempt to deliver some particular aim usually tied to killing or making money is an obsession. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's pushed by sensibility. You want it now, you want it overnight. Uh, you, don't want to, you don't want to send the soldiers so you can just have your joysticks in Arizona or Hancock, wherever it is. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's this obsession with short-term gain, shorter-term gain, quick gain. And people say, well, they've got a lot of positive effects. It might help some, it may help the doctors find the sick, or it may help somebody lost in the, in the Yosemite Park. Well, that's true. That's true. Technology always has two sides to it. It's always Janet's face in that regard, no doubt. But we're just trying to connect it to structures of domination, we're trying to connect it to forms of exploitation. Uh, and, that, and that's, I think what has been magnificent about the Peace Council, and we should give it up for Sister Medea Benjamin and Coach Pink. They have been a wonderful All of us say it's going to say it's going to work. Thank you again for connecting the dots between poverty and education and between the babies in Afghanistan and the babies in Syracuse, because Onondaga Citizens League just came out with a report saying that our kids are not ready for kindergarten. And they want Dolly Parton to send every kid in Onondaga County a book. Now that might be okay, but this is something that's been going on for 40 years, Mr. West. And we want to make sure that something is going to change the structural you know, disparities in this county 
such that we won't have 40, 50 percent of our kids under five living in poverty. So what do we need to do as a community besides sending them books? And what do we need to do to make sure that all kids are ready for not only kindergarten, but even Head Start and Pre-K? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, I appreciate the heartfelt quality of that question too, though, Bob. I mean, I think in one sense, you recall Brother Martin went down trying to eradicate poverty in the way in which Frederick Douglass was trying to eradicate slavery, the way Lloyd Garrison was trying to eradicate slavery, Ida B. Wells trying to eradicate lynching. We need an abolitionist movement around poverty. We need a serious abolitionist movement around poverty. Now, that might be further down the road. It means that we have to come together from different communities. I mean, I think one of the worst things that has happened in our highly uh, atomized, individualized uh, society is that we think that we only should talk about an issue if it directly affects us, as opposed to being concerned about what's going on in other neighborhoods, other parts of the city, and coming together, because this issue of education means all of our dest destinies are tied together. But it's just a matter of the interest group, interest group. This is the worst thing that's happened to the Black Freedom Movement. When people think of the black freedom movement, the first thing they think of is what? The black community and black interests. No, 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 black folk never. We've never been a people only concerned about our interests. We have our interests, but we have integrity, honesty, decency, principles. Right. We've always been concerned about all of those. You see? But the same is true. The trade union movement not just, to, just concerned about workers, they're concerned about the quality of the society and workers are an integral part of that, which means they ought to be concerned about the immigration issue, sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, and so forth, you see. So we have to get out of these boxes and just interest group, interest group, interest group. That's the first thing. So the suburbs and the techno verbs that come together with the herbs. <laughs> Our issue together, we're concerned about these precious children, no matter what neighborhood or who they're from. That's the first thing. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Running with that microphone. Okay, Cornell, oh, excuse me. Uh, I, I would like to ask you uh, how are the drones? Uh, any different than the, um, what do they call the, the, the killing thing they had in Germany? The 30s. No, 30s, the 30s, way back. The two rocks. Oh. The concentration camps, they burned the people, oh, oh, oh. and the, a mor not the moratorium. Crematoriums. Okay. Uh, okay. Any than the drones because they result in the same thing. We are killing an uh, enemy, people we hate. The, the, the killing, they always have a killing instrument. And I don't see any difference. So I think that we can, that we're doing the same things that the German people did in the 30s with our killing. Yeah, I mean, I don't like to engage in this algebra of blood where you compare all of these different things. All of them are so vicious, all of them are so ugly. They have different scopes and different breaths and so forth, but once we see how immoral they are and how unjust they are, that ought to be sufficient motiv motivation to want to ensure that it doesn't happen again, be it a drone or a concentration camp or an internment camp for Japanese uh, in, the 19, uh, in the 1940s and so forth. Uh, uh, very much so. I think that the, uh, but what, what is important in, 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 in when it comes to the drones for us today is the level of secrecy and lack of transparency and sheer mendacity. They just lie about it when they get caught, Brennan and the others. You see. And that's our government that we have direct access to. And that's something that it does, I, I think, define it in a very different way than some of the other very ugly and indescribable forms of evil, like what happened to Jewish brothers and sisters under, uh, under Hitler and the Nazis, or what happened in you know, the, 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 the Congo under the Belgium, five and a half, six million people viciously killed and so forth, go on and on, Pol Pot, we go on, Stalin, Mao, I mean, we human beings, we've got a record. 
Whoa, we got a vicious and ugly record, I'm telling you. We got, I think, two more questions. I don't know what, oh, his brother got a microphone on. Right? I know, I know drums are bad, but I don't understand why some people think they're good. Do you know why? Oh, wonderful question, my dear, my dear sister. Definitely. I would want to ask the people who say drones are good, I want to hear what their argument is. I don't think they have an argument that is in any way persuasive, my dear sister. I think that they're following either lies that are put forward by the mainstream or they're accenting certain uses of drones that they are projecting in the future. The drones we're talking about here tonight, I don't think anybody could ever claim that forms of bombings that result in the loss of lives of innocent people, including precious young folk like yourself, is good. That's never, ever, ever, ever good. That's never, ever, ever good. I'd like to know if uh, the dot of uh, the events of the New Pearl Harbor of uh, 11 September 2001 is among the dots that you've been connected. And if it is, how have you connected? Mm. Thank you. Someone 9-11? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, see, when, when I was thinking of connecting dots, I was thinking more of structures as opposed to events. See, when I talked about Wall Street, the uh, oligarchic complex, that's a structure. You talk about the prison industrial complex, that's a structure. You're talking about the corporate multiplex, that's a structure. 9-11 was a particular event that took place. It was a vicious event in which resulted in the lives of innocent people. And uh, we, we, we needed analysis of what was conditions under which it took place, who was responsible, and so forth and so on. But that event must be understood in light of the structures that I'm talking about. See? So for me, that's how a discussion should proceed. So we don't somehow view it as something that is so uh, uh, aberrational in the history of the United States. There's a long, long history of American terrorism, not just in this country, indigenous peoples and black peoples and workers and women and so forth, but in Latin America and in the Caribbean, in, the, in Asia and so forth. So when you get a, 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 a terrorist act, which is to say killing of innocent people in New York City and, and so forth, and we do need analysis of exactly who it was and so forth and so on, no doubt about that, but it's not in any way some kind of uh, uh, aberration in the history of this country in relation to terrorism. It's just that we had to experience it as if it was something new. I mean, I've called it in the past a kind of niggerization of the country. because It's the first time all Americans felt unsafe, unprotected, subject to random violence and hated for who they are. Whereas to be black in America, unsafe, unprotected, subject to random violence and hated for who you are. But well, for a lot of black folk, they, what do you think about 9-11? It's a very sad situation, but uh, I've been 9 11 fired for a long time. <laughs> I've had to experience it over and over and over again. The question is, what is our response? Is, is it the response of Emma Till's mother to American terrorism? Or is it the response of George Bush? Hunt them down like cockroaches and consume or Obama increase the terror in other parts and slowly pull back on the ugly invasion and occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan with U.S. mercenaries still in place and with U.S. government still willing to provide them resources. What is the response to 9-11? the event in light of the four structural realities that I was alluding to. That's the beginning of an answer to your question, though, brother, even though we need much more time. Much more time. <laughs>